Thanks everybody, good morning. Welcome to Brisbane. For those of you who are new to here, lucky you weren't here last week for the storms. That would have been an intense challenge for you, but this won't be so much of a challenge, I don't think. Um, what I want to do is talk about the project that Janice and I ran as PSF from an ALTC grant. Um, it was actually run quite a while ago now, from 2010 to uh, 2012. And we had five partners who I'll list at the end. Uh, we interviewed lots of different people, different cohorts. So got the views of students about capstones, uh, lecturers, associate deans, alumni, so students who had done a capstone and some who hadn't, and what they thought about that idea of doing one of these things. Um, we also looked at course materials. So when we say there that we did a website audit, uh, what we did was just looked at all the business schools um, course guides and looked at what we thought was a capstone. Some things um, were called a capstone but we would have thought they weren't really. Others were a capstone and just looked at their criteria, their assessment, the learning activities, etc. Uh, and that, that was quite a useful exercise to see what was going on. If we had the time and energy and enthusiasm, it would have been good to do a follow-up and the money, um, a follow-up audit now, because I think that there would be a lot more capstones and probably a little bit more thought through. Not, not that some of them weren't, some of them were very good, but I think that they're much more common, you know, three or four years down the track. In terms of outputs, uh, we have the good practice guide here, the little light's not going. Um, they're on the thing here, I won't walk over there, but they're just, the book's there, if you wish to take one, please do, they're free and we have lots of them hanging around the office, so <laughs> we're more than happy, um, I'm more than happy for you to take a few for your colleagues or whatever. We did a literature review um, of the theories of capstones and that's in the book as well. Um, journal article says, um, uh, an article coming out, or oh, it's out now in the latest edition of Heard, that you might be interested in called Capping Them Off. We also have a website, a page that's still live and that has all of the things that I've been talking about, the good practice guide, um, planning a capstone course about them, if you're interested in the theory, there's some um, uh, learning and teaching um, information as well. So please go and have a look at that website if you're particularly interested in capstones. So what I want to do is have a look at the experiences and types, and again, there's much more information about this in the, in the little books. Um, go through some of the features, some of the key findings from our project, talk a little bit about capability and employability, though I'm nervous to use those words now because someone's just tried to clarify the difference of them, and then some learning and teaching approaches. So we'll begin by looking at the different experiences and types. Um, capstone units are just one kind of subset of capstone experiences. Um, but basically it's about developing professional identities and getting people to be confident and ready to face the workplace. So giving them some experience of what it would be like to work um, in a particular kind of job. And there are lots of ways of doing that, work integrated learning, internships, people mentioned here before. We teach that, I actually come from the discipline of political science and public policy which is a little bit unusual in a business school, but don't ask that there are political reasons why that's the case, and we're happy to sit there. And I think that there's a role for government in, and business together anyway. But we have internships in organisations where students have to go cold to a political organisation. It could be a politician, it could be a non-for-profit group or a political party, and they do work experience with that particular group for a semester. Again, as Pierre said, it's not about making the coffee. You get allocated a supervisor and do some project work. So it's very good networking opportunities. People learn skills on the ground. Non-profit groups get some free labour. These students are really ready to graduate. So everybody wins out of this kind of experience. We also have um, uh, parliamentary projects where students can get a semester following a politician around basically and doing some work for them. So that's that's just in my own discipline an example of internships. And clearly there's study abroad which obviously would be a fantastic opportunity. Now this is probably a little bit controversial but 
capstones at the moment are in the final semester, generally speaking, of a, of a degree. They could be on earlier, but you would need the support of your colleagues and it would have to be fed into your degree program a little bit more, I think. And we were just talking in our, group, our little um, discussion there. Is it too much to expect people to be workplace ready in just that final semester of their degree? Should we be developing those skills and capabilities from first year? So that's something that you might want to discuss. But our experience and when we did that, our project was looking at capstones pretty much in the final year and the final semester of a student's degree. There are three different types and this comes from the literature by Rouse et al. And those developed types are very useful in trying to track the progress and the trends and the practices of capstones. So the most common one that we found in um, our study was the magnet. So that's discipline specific. So if you are a marketing major, you would all do the same capstone in that particular degree, the same program. If you were doing a mountaintop, it's much more challenging because it's multidisciplinary. So you're bringing these different um, disciplines together across the majors and students would have to do the same course, the same capstone, um, in that one course. So you could come from accounting or law or humanities or whatever. And I know JCU's done some interesting work in this, as has Wollongong as well. Obviously for this to work you need to get the support of the staff and the students. Even administrative challenges will, will be very um, evident who's going to enter the marks, who owns the course, you know, who takes the credit for it, who gets the funding, who does the timetabling. But it's not to say that these things are not possible because they are. And the final kind of capstone experience is the mandate. This is something that we didn't really look at because it's what's required by an outside body. So if you're an accountant, you have to do that practitioner kind of um, registration exercise or whatever it is to get the certificate. So we're not really looking at We're looking more at the magnets and the mountaintops. So let's look at the features of the capstone, um, or what we call professionals in training. That was one of the uh, phrases that we came up with when we were interviewing people and, and getting the information together. It's about getting p our students to be very proactive. So one of the case studies we um, came across when we interviewed a lecturer was in the uh, discipline of public relations where students would get access to a PR firm. Someone would, a practitioner would come into class um, and then students would become um, involved in boot camps where they'd have to deal with clients and develop a plan for non-for-profit groups. Um, they might have to develop a, a quick message in 30 minutes or write a brief for a client or a media release. Something like that, but the idea was to draw together the learnings they had got so far in their degree and prepare for the workplace. Um, so it's all of these things that I'm talking about here. Consolidating previous learning, applying that as well, but also doing that little bit more. Um, doing the right side of the brain kind of thing. <coughs> so the reflective stuff that someone mentioned a little while ago. Um, have I got leadership skills? What, what's my purpose here? Am I behaving ethically? Um, so it's cognitive but effective aims as well. And that idea of a bridge. And that's why we have the, the image there of Janus looking backward, but also forward as well. Okay, so what we found in our research is that backward stuff is pretty much there. You know, people are putting together different learnings and you know, students are learning a lot of information and content. It's the looking forward, that's the more challenging kind of aspect of capstones. How do you really instill this idea of capabilities and give students the confidence to do that as well? So one way of doing this is to do project-based teamwork. We all know the challenges of teamwork. We know students resist it um, for a range of reasons, but it's a way of saying to students, you're going to probably have to work in teams in the workplace anyway. You're going to find people that are difficult or lazy or stupid, whatever it is, you're just going to have to work around that and deal with different personalities and different people. So it gives them the opportunity to tackle particular problems, to become independent learners, 
and to think on their feet. I think that's one of the challenges of a capstone where they are put out of their comfort zone. You know, it's not just, oh, look, Liz is giving a two hour lecture or we'll do a little bit of, she'll ask us some questions or, you know, we'll do a bit of interactive work, you know, but we'll kick back and look out the window and what I'm having for lunch or what Facebook my friends. You know, we know what they're like. And mind you, they still do that in a capstone with no shame, I have to say. But they, they somehow are engaged in a different way. The onus is much more on them to take control or to be much more engaged in the course itself. So for my particular capstone, I have a couple of um, uh, traditional lectures, if you like, and then the onus is on them to do the work from then on for the rest of the semester. And that's a, an important way of getting them ready for that transition to the workplace. One of the controversial things about a capstone is the idea of not having exams. It might work for your particular discipline, but it's not about testing what did you learn. So we, we, we tend to find that cap, um, capstones don't necessarily have exams. Uh, there could be less formal contact time, as I mentioned, and lots more informal activities. So when we did the audit, this is what we found when we went through the websites of the different courses. 36% of all Australian business schools had some kind of capstone for all students and 51% had some for some students. Um, they were spread unevenly and that's why I'd love to do this research again because I suspect that as we're getting pushed by universities, and like it's in our academic plan at Griffith, that you have a capstone and I think that that's quite common. Um, I suspect that there'd be a lot more support for them. There'd be a lot more lecturers doing really innovative things. Um, though they still have to fit in with what the requirements of their program tell them to do. The key message I think that I'd like you, you to take away um, is a very simple one. There's no one model for a capstone. I think it's important that the lecturers are enthusiastic, that they get support from their heads of school or their teaching and learning deans, whoever. But there's no overly prescriptive way or plan for capstone experiences and that's, the literature says that, our book says that, you know, it, it's, so that's good because it gives you the flexibility to do what suits you, you know your own students and their capabilities in the university environment and what you think would work. Um, also some key findings were that uh, capstones were a good site for assurance of learning if you're into all that administrative stuff that we have to do unfortunately these days. Okay, so in terms of capability and employability, um, what we found in the course guides that we looked at, the course outlines, is that, as I mentioned before, there was an explicit focus on the backward kind of functions, integrating, etc., but less on the forward one, so getting them ready for jobs. Um, you know, how can students really construct their own knowledge um, and examine real life situations? Um, solve problems but that are really relevant not just to the university degree but to the workplace as well. So trying to give them more of that professional socialisation. So for my class, because um, I teach a course called Solving Policy Problems where they have to pretend they're public servants or in the second half of the course they have to pretend that they're the cabinet ministers and I'm the prime minister which is scary when you're trying to be Tony Abbott. Um, but. Uh, the students really get into that, some of them get dressed up and, and get into that whole mindset of what it's like to be a public servant. So, and what I tell them quite consistently is you can apply these skills even, to, even into areas where you're not going to be necessarily be a public servant. You might be working for a non-for-profit group or in a big private company, but you will still find the skills of learning to think on your feet, um, answering questions very quickly, gathering the research and presenting it in a clear and convincing way, arguing about the politics of a situation. Um, those sorts of skills will, will hold you in good stead no matter what you do. So just to, to give you a, a couple of examples, and they're in the um, Good Practice Guide if you want a little bit more of in-depth information. Um, a lot of the capstones that we looked at they will bring in practitioners to present live cases. So in my case, I have two public servants at a fairly senior level uh, who come in. One of them comes in in about week three and says, this is how you write a brief, uh, which is very important because students have to do that and then present it. They also have to present a cabinet um, submission and that's when they pretend they're the ministers of the Crown. 
the first exercise with the brief, they pretend that they're just public servants. But it gives them that experience of um, writing condensed pieces with a clear argument that they're trying to sell. Um, then I also bring in another practitioner in about week eight and they say, this is what it's like to be a public servant. This is how I started. Who would have thought I ended up over here? And all the different things they do because, of course, the stereotype of public servants are sitting around in their grey cardies. No offence to anyone who is wearing a grey cardie. But, um, you know, and just looking at the clock and waiting until their next leave. Those stereotypes really need to be um, demystified because they're not true and, and public servants have a very challenging life um, and very, do very interesting work. So it's good for students to hear that from the public servants themselves. Um, other examples of uh, innovation that we found were things like strategic marketing. You're probably all familiar much more than that. Uh, financial planning, where students have to um, solve a problem in a fairly heavy duty kind of way, where they have to design and implement solutions to a problem. Um, they have to come up with a statement of advice or financial plan that meets the individual um, or industry standards. Uh, they have to draw on relevant theories to do that. So that's the other thing that capstones have to do, is try and draw on the theories that you have taught the students in your particular discipline over the past two and a half years. Public relations I mentioned before. Um, the Mountaintop, uh, one of our uh, partners, um, Wollongong Uni, developed this computer simulation that was based on socially innovative um, commerce and they used the UN Global Compact. So trying to apply com commerce principles but looking at environmental issues and profits and costs. So if you're a big greenie, you probably might have failed because you wouldn't have made enough profit. If you want to know more about um, this particular issue, Belinda's here today. <laughs> Um, from Wollongong, so she might like to um, talk about it. Um, one of the people who's involved. I was going to put her on the spot, but she didn't, <laughs> didn't want to be. But she knows a lot more about what was going on in Wollongong than I do. Okay, and then learning and teaching approaches. See the Good Practice Guide on the website. I haven't got time to go into all these different kind of approaches. These were the main ones that we found from our research, from talking to people, looking at guides, looking at... Um, uh, Course, um, course guides, looking at the literature, etc. A lot of it from overseas. And yes, there is some overlap between the different kinds of teaching approaches. But if you're interested, that's something you might want to chase up in your own time. And these were our partner projects. Linda Andrews from QUT is here today as well. Um, people from Wollongong, Newcastle, Macquarie and um, obviously Griffith. So look, um, I'll leave it there, I think, Pierre. That's, I don't know how long I've been talking, but probably for long enough.